I wonder if this fence would make a good antenna for receiving, perhaps. You know, it's a wire fence, goes all the way around this property. Let's find out. Let's see here. 10 megahertz. Hear that? Alligator clip, antenna. WWV. About S6. What do you know? It works. What's this? You're wondering. Well, that's what this video is about. The Malahit DSP portable receiver. Let's have a look at it. Before I get started, I want to say a great big thank you to one of my Patreon supporters, Joe, who sent me this radio. Um, he thought perhaps we could do a review of it and that I might find some use for it. I think he ended up with two and didn't need the extra one, so he sent it to me. And hey, Joe, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate it. I'm going to have some fun with this, and uh, we'll probably get a few videos out of it. So this is a Chinese version of the Malahit DSP SDR radio. This is a tiny little box which has the full receiver in it that is uh, of course software defined uh, radio. Let's power it on. Uh, to power it up there's a start button up here. Well, there's a First off there's a power switch down here and I think that's just main battery power. When you flip that on though the radio doesn't turn on. It uh, Waits for you to press the start button here three times rapidly. One, two, three. And there we go. We get a copyright notice. And it does have the authors attributed there in that startup screen. And uh, that's the radio's user interface. This is a touch screen, so you can enter frequency directly. One, five megahertz. It switches to 15 megahertz. Uh, there's a tuning knob over here. In fact, let's look at the sides. Okay, on this side, we have the volume knob and the tuning knob, and they are both push-button encoders, so you push them in to do certain functions. There's a USB-C port here for charging, and additionally, when I plug this into my computer, it creates a sound uh, device for uh, reception and a serial port for rig control, although I have not been able to get that to work yet. They say that it obeys the uh, Kenwood TS-480 command set, which is a very limited CAT set, but uh, I've yet to make it work. However, the audio interface is pretty useful um, for decoding digital stuff or just recording the audio on your computer using something like Audacity. I don't know about drivers in the Windows world, under Linux, when I plugged this in, uh, it was just instantly recognized and the serial port and audio devices showed right up. Uh, the top has the little push button that you use to start it up and turn it off and an SMA connector for um, your antenna. This side, we have uh, nothing but an audio port for uh, audio out. Stereo headphones you can plug in, and uh, by the way, if you're on wide FM mode uh, for like the FM broadcast band, it will uh, decode stereo audio. So you could use this as a really expensive pocket Walkman. On this side, we just have a tiny little hole marked DFU. I think that's a push button in there. I have not researched what that's for yet. And this tiny little bitty power switch that turns the main power on and off. On the back, uh, we have the uh, sticker with the model number, MDR2000, uh, and a frequency range listed of 50 kilohertz to 2 gigahertz. Wow, that's quite a range. And a serial number. So, that's the little radio. Let's look at the user interface. So, the uh, touch screen has buttons across the bottom here. Hard, audio, visual, noise reduction, mode, and band. Many of those are self-explanatory. If we tap band, we see several of the common um, amateur bands listed across the top here. It says up here page five, 505, and I think, yeah, there we go, 405, 
There's some two meter band frequencies up at the top there, some 440 frequencies at the bottom. They're all the same. I suspect that these are memories that we can adjust. Um, you might have noticed there I had to click several times before this advanced. Um, this encoder is not reliable or it's the software not sensing it. Some people are saying it's the software um, is not quickly enough scanning the encoder to catch the steps. It's got these nice presets in here, but you don't have to use those. You can uh, tap the frequency and then put it in directly. So let's say 14.3, 14.3 megahertz. So that's the uh, marine net on 20 meters. We're in USB mode across the top here. It gives us the mode we're in, the AGC, our volume, and the filter type. Uh, right now set to normal and AGC is, uh, oh yeah, AGC is set at medium. Uh, we get the nice spectrum display here and a waterfall. So if there's signals present, we should uh, hear and see them. I have an antenna hooked up right at the moment. I've got this little BNC adapter and I'm plugged into my doublet. So uh, <laughs> I should be hearing them, but I don't hear them. Just noise. Now here I'm going to rotate this to dial the frequency and watch watch the detent. And you'll see how sometimes it doesn't step and sometimes it double steps. There it double stepped. And if I move it just slightly, I can get it to... Yeah, that's not consistent. Okay. I don't think it's mechanical. It's not consistent enough to be mechanical. I think it is software. I think it's not scanning the control rapidly enough to catch every step that you make. So that's about the only annoying thing about this radio for me is that when you're trying to tune, sometimes it's really hard to get to the frequency you want. Uh, anyway, back to the user interface. Um, visual, well, let's start at the, we started at the right. Okay, so band, uh, obviously the band select registers. Mode, if we tap that, Upper sideband, lower sideband, AM, narrow FM, wide FM. And it has a decoder for CW, uh, which will decode the CW to the screen. Um, noise reduction, let's get out of that. Visual, uh, that lets us set things like the brightness on the screen. Um, screen sleep times. I don't know what the sleep... Okay, sleep times the radio, LCD sleep is the screen. Um... FFT, I think, is the waterfall. Yep, colors and sensitivity. Um, and so on. So various visual aspects of the display you can set here. Audio. I'm going to get out of that. Audio. Uh, yeah, well, take a look. You can see what's there. We've got uh, various settings we can do. There's an EQ. I haven't played with that yet, but uh, apparently you can EQ the audio. AGC, you can not only um, set the speed, but you can also set thresholds, uh, which is kind of nice. You can really control the behavior of the AGC. Filters. Uh, there are three default filters. Normal. Uh, select it, and then I use this one. Yeah, this one to control it. Wide, normal, narrow. And you'll see the, uh, the low and high frequencies of the filter. Uh, appear there as well, so you can adjust those independently. So like on upper sideband, wide, it's going to 3.5 kilohertz at the top end of the filter, 100 hertz at the bottom. Normal, 100 hertz and 3 kilohertz, which seems still a little wide to me, but that's all right. And then uh, 1.8 kilohertz and 100 hertz for the uh, narrow setting. So if I wanted to lower that upper threshold on the, on the or raise that lower threshold on the wide, um, there we go. We can go to four, five. Wait, I think we can go all the way up to 10 kilohertz uh, wide, even though we're on upper sideband mode. So you can go quite wide. I like to use that when I'm shortwave listening sometimes. I'll have a shortwave station that's right beside another station, and I'll switch to one of the sidebands uh, to not hear the annoying station and hear the one I want. And being able to widen that filter out really improves fidelity. So, yeah, we got some settings there for audio. Okay, uh, hard. I don't know why they call it hard. This is actually more like system settings, right? So we've got... Uh, man, I really... Even with my glasses, I'm having a hard time seeing this. 
RF gain, uh, in, antenna input impedance, a preamp that you can turn on and off, an attenuator. Um, I'm not sure what mixed GR is. Uh, frequency correct, that lets you correct the oscillator uh, in here to get it on frequency. And I had to shift it 235 hertz to get it on frequency, so it was off by default. And I used WWV and I just zero beated it using this, uh, this setting. Uh, beep level is the audio level. Um, indicator type, signal to noise ratio. Uh, that's up here by the S meter. Um, I guess that's valuable to have, but uh, you know, it's nice that it gives you some more information on here. Anyway, so pretty basic user interface. We'll compare it. I'll hook this up and I'll bring up the 705 and uh, we'll compare and, and find a station and we'll see how sensitive this is. But that's basically the user interface. The screen is not very bright. Uh, if you're out in bright sunlight, as you saw in the opening segment, I had to shield it and I could barely see the display. So it doesn't really uh, work well in bright sunlight, but uh, that's okay. So uh, let's compare its uh, sensitivity to like the ICOM 705 and, and see how it does. All right, let's compare. So I've got this obviously on WWV 15 uh, megahertz. Got the ICOM also set to that. The audio is being captured via the USB um, from the Malahit. But first, let's listen to the camera audio so you can hear the speaker. And then here is the audio being captured direct. Now, even though we're in a, well, we're in USB mode right now, I wanted to compare apples to apples. So we'll put the ICOM also in USB. And if I switch my antennas, we'll be hearing the ICOM. Now let's go to AM mode. There's the ICOM. Switch antennas. And on the Malahit, uh, I'm sure you can hear that. There's a little kind of a hissy noise to it on AM decode. And the filter is wide. Let's uh, go to a narrower filter. Okay, so that was noise we were picking up from, uh, I guess, the upper edges of the filter static coming in. Put the, uh, okay, the filter on the ICOM is 10 kilohertz, and the filter on this, we'll set it to wide, is 9 kilohertz, so a slightly narrower filter. And let's listen to the audio from the Malahit. And as you can hear, noisy. Okay, we'll switch antennas to the ICOM. Yeah, I can hear the same hiss. Let me record that for you. So there's the audio from the ICOM. And we're getting about a little over S9, about S10 on the signal. Let's go back to the Malahit. Hours, 23 minutes. Uh, a little over S9, not quite S10 on the S meter. Of course, who knows how well calibrated that is. Three minutes, coordinated universal time. And there's the audio being captured from the Malahit. Hours, so comparable. Um, comparable. Okay. Turn that volume down. So yeah, fairly comparable received performance. Let's uh, let's go look at. Uh, 
Here's a comparison. Okay, let's listen to the noise reduction on this. <laughs> Going to blank here, where the the two rivers, one flows north and one flows south. I can't uh, can't think of uh, yeah the Red River and the uh, Minnesota River. All right, let's look at noise reduction on the ICOM. And of course, or up there uh, toward the Canadian border, over there north of. Uh, Duluth, I suppose, or Hibbing, somewhere in that neighborhood. Been been both places, but it's been a while. But uh, have a pretty good idea what you're talking about there. Well, we're we're running about 400 watts into a noise end. reduction on the ICOM. Rolling, so that's the story on this end. Band condition. Noise reduction on the Malahit. That's the greatest, that's for sure. Over. Yeah, I've got you here as an S9. I mean, you're coming in really good, and I've uh, I'm running about. About S5, about S9. Again, I don't know how accurate the S meter is on this guy, but it seems to be fairly sensitive. Okay, so there you go, a comparison between the two. Um, it does pretty well. I'm, I'm kind of impressed. Of course, it's going to depend on your antenna, and I have it hooked up to my big doublet, which is up on the mast here, you can see. Um, it's about 33 feet at the apex and it's cut for a half a wave on 80 meters, about 127, 128 feet, somewhere around there uh, in length. So that's the antenna that I'm on at the moment. But uh, you know, overall, it's, it's pretty useful. What would you use this thing for? Uh, well, portable shortwave listening out in the field, perhaps. Um, you might use it to hunt down interference, you know, put a little telescoping antenna on there, tune to wherever the interference is and go walking around and try to find where it's at. That could be handy. Um, you could use it for decoding digital stuff off of uh, like weather facts or the digital ham modes. I mean, it's you know it's a versatile little um, SDR receiver. Battery life seems quite good. It's fully charged now. I've had it on for a couple of hours and it wasn't even halfway down yet. So battery life seems pretty good. Overall, I'd say it's a nice little receiver for uh, what you pay for it. Uh, I, I looked it up on eBay. Uh, it's about $211 from one eBay seller. There's probably several eBay sellers. So uh, where you get it from is up to you. The Chinese one, I don't know. It's it's pretty well built. This is a metal case, um, aluminum case. It looks really nice. Uh, overall, I think it's, it's actually quite a good build. So I'd say if I was looking for a portable shortwave uh, receiver or portable receiver, I'd be very tempted on this. Um, I want to say again, thank you very much to Joe for sending this to me for a review. And you'll probably see this in future videos. I'm sure that I'll find um, all kinds of uses for it down the road. Um, having a nice little receiver just handy to, to go to like this. Can, I can see some areas where it could be very useful. So anyway, that's my quick look at or overview of the Malahit DSP SDR radio. Thanks again, Joe, for sending me this. I'm going to have some fun with it, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.